Maintaining a so-called perfect weed-free and manicured lawn, that takes a lot of time and money. So tonight, let's talk about some alternative approaches. And for that, we have Dr. Greta Gromick. Greta's an associate professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at NDSU. And Greta, your life is so surrounded by weeds. It's, it's just unbelievable. You teach courses on weed identification, weed biology, and weed ecology. And Greta also conducts research on non-chemical weed management, integrated weed management, weed ecology, and also weed management in organic production systems. That's a lot of weeds. So you are the right person to talk about that. Greta, uh, thank you and welcome to the forums. Okay, thanks Tom for the introduction. I'd like to offer one caveat, which is that I am a weed scientist and not a turf grass expert, but I got interested in this topic because I am an owner of a lawn. And so first though, I'm going to be a little academic and take you through maybe a five minute version of my weed ecology class. We're gonna start off by defining what ecology is. So ecology is a scientific discipline and as such ecologists are trying to understand the natural world by collecting data and testing hypotheses. Sometimes people get confused and they think that ecology is equivalent to environmentalism, but it's a formal scientific discipline. And to understand it a little bit, we can break down the word ecology. It comes from two Greek words, oikos, meaning household, and logos, meaning study. And so our house is the planet Earth. So we're studying everything. And that's why ecology is a very difficult scientific discipline because everything is very complicated and there's lots of interconnections. All right, so that's the ecology part. What about a weed? If you ask people, What's a weed? Most people will tell you, well, it's a plant out of place. And that's a pretty good definition um, from some viewpoints. But there's lots of other ways of looking at weeds. And so I want to go through these. The first is an anthropogenic viewpoint. And that means from the human's viewpoint. And a plant out of place would be a definition of, the, of a weed that is um, based on this viewpoint and it's it's it has to do with our values and it says that weeds interfere with our objectives or our requirements but that's not the only way of looking at a weed there's also a biogeographical viewpoint that views a weed as an invader from an, a non-native introduced place it's an alien and so a lot of our noxious weeds, for instance, are introduced from other places. And that's one of the things that causes them to be invasive. And then finally, there's an ecological viewpoint. And this says that weeds are pioneers in succession or they're colonizers. So the ecological viewpoint is defining weeds in terms of their function in ecosystems. They're just plants. And they happen to evolve to fulfill certain roles. And a lot of them are really good at colonizing disturbances. And humans are good at disturbing things. And so, hence, we have lots of weeds. So when we study weed ecology, we're studying interactions. We're in, in the case of a, a cropland system, we might be studying the interactions between crops and weeds, the animals in the system, the microorganisms in the system, and also how all those things interact with the abiotic environment. So we use that understanding to create weed management approaches. So I thought I'd give you just a brief history of weed management before we talk about weed management approaches. Prior to 1946, weeds were mostly controlled mechanically. And there were some inorganic herbicides like sodium arsenite, 
salts, acids, but these were non-selective, meaning they would damage all the plants. In 1946, with the um, introduction of 2,4-D, we then had a synthetic herbicide that was selective. It would kill broadleaf plants, but not grasses. And that's extraordinarily useful for lawns and in cropland. So when we're spraying herbicides on our lawn, we're spraying chemicals generally that will kill the weeds, but not the grass. And then, of course, we had the GMO era. And there are some turf grass um, plants, some turf grass grasses that are resistant to glyphosate, but I won't talk about that very much. So herbicides work very well in croplands and also in lawns, but there are a lot of challenges to herbicide intensive approaches. And especially with regard to lawns, we have some environmental concerns, social and health concerns, and also maybe some economic concerns because it's expensive to spray all those chemicals. And so maybe we would be interested in formulating some alternative approaches. And the concept of integrated weed management gives us a framework in which we can envision a more multi-tactic approach to managing weeds in lots of different types of systems, but it would be applicable to lawns. And integrated weed management tries to pull together a bunch of different tactics from four different categories, physical, cultural, biological, and chemical. And the main philosophy is we want to use a variety of tactics because no one strategy is a silver bullet but we can do a lot of things together to achieve our management goals. So now I'm going to get into the part about lawns and I'm going to try to connect the ideas about weed ecology, studying all these interactions, integrated weed management, lots of different things and what we're doing with our lawns. But first, a little bit of lawn history. So the earliest lawns were areas of low vegetation. They usually weren't grass. They might be things like creeping thyme or chamomile. And these surrounded medieval castles in France and the UK. And the function was to have some low vegetation so you could see the enemy coming to your castle. It wasn't until about the 17th century that uh, wealthy Brits adopted grass lawns that were closely shorn. And uh, because this was prior to the invention of the lawnmower, they were often shorn by sheep. And lawns eventually came to the United States, but they were still really only for wealthy people. But there were a few things that happened that changed that. One was urbanization, leading to an interest in green spaces and parks, and this included lawns. And then the invention of the lawnmower facilitated mechanical management of these lawns, and you didn't need to have sheep grazing them anymore. And then finally, and most importantly, probably the development of suburbs in the 1940s and 50s led to widespread adoption of grass lawns by middle class people. And it was during this time that the idea of a perfect, weed free, neatly manicured cured lawn became kind of a symbol of upward mobility because remember these lawns were once only something that the wealthy could have and furthermore these lawns would signify an admirable upstanding moral character and anyone who has a neighbor has probably felt their neighbor's eyes on their yard and that you feel obligated to keep your yard a certain way so that your neighbors will be happy and that's kind of what I'm talking about. So that's what we're seeing here in the picture on the left. You've got this beautiful, pure grass. It's shorn very closely and it's neatly edged. There's no weeds or any other plants to be seen. And that's what people have come to view as beautiful and desirable. However, there are a lot of drawbacks to maintaining lawns like this. 
Um, lawns cover 40 million acres. So what we're doing with our yards has a huge impact on the ecosystems. That's just in the United States. And these yards are using 30 to 60 percent of our fresh water. We use 90 million pounds of fertilizer a year in the U.S., 78 million pounds of pesticides per year on our lawns. And all of this costs 40 billion dollars for per year. Um, furthermore, our mowers emit tons of pollution, as much as 34 cars, because mowers don't have the same standards for emissions controls that automobiles have. And also, all that fertilizer use tends to result in runoff of nitrogen, and about 40 to 60 percent of the nitrogen applied to lawns runs off into our surface waters and acts as a pollutant. And so for all of these reasons, people are trying to reimagine what they could do with this space around their house called a lawn. And I'm going to talk about a number of different ideas that people have about this reimagination. And one thing is that people are interested in growing food in their yards. And there's a lot of advantages to this. Why grow food in a city lawn? It is a part of positive community development. It can contribute to education, especially of disadvantaged people and children. You're reducing food miles, increasing access to fresh produce, and the produce promotes human health. These gardens also provide eco service ecosystem services like food for pollinators and they can also help regenerate wasted areas in cities like empty lots leading to improvement. So there's a lot of reasons to reimagine places that could be lawns as gardens instead. Um, but we also have all these lawns in the city and sometimes lawns and gardens don't mix very well. Last year in my garden, I had a big, beautiful strawberry patch. And then in mid-June, I came out one day and noticed that in the middle of my patch, it was just brown and dead. And it was caused by herbicide drift. Someone had sprayed their yard, and then that herbicide had volatilized and drifted and hurt my strawberries. And so maybe people don't realize this, but herbicides that are used on lawns can move around and they move around via drift in the wind and also volatilization that occurs with heat and although some formulations are safer and less prone to volatilization a lot of the forms that are used by lawn care services have this problem and it is very risky for a lot of ornamental and edible things that you might be growing around your lawn like grapes, tomatoes, beans, melons, and a whole host of um, horticultural plants like elders, maples, and roses. So in order to solve this problem, we, I mean, we still want to control our weeds, but maybe we'd like to cut down on some of this mowing and fuel use and nitrogen fertilizer use and pesticide use. And so we can go back to what we know from ecology to find some answers. And one thing that is a fundamental tenet in ecology is that nature abhors a vacuum. If there's an open niche, then something is going to come in. And in a lawn, that's going to be, generally speaking, a weed. So if you mow your grass way too short, you're going to create spaces where weeds can come in. Uh, another theory in ecology is that greater species diversity leads to more stability and greater stability leads to a resistance to being invaded by weeds. So we can take these two principles and put them together with ideas from integrated weed management and come up with some new solutions for beautiful lawns. So. On the left, this is a picture of a lawn that was created using no-mow fescue species. And these just grow to that height, and you don't mow them at all. And how it works is it's just a thick mat of turf, and there's no vacuum. 
a weed can't get in there. And so you don't have to mow, you don't have to put on herbicide, easy peasy. Sure, you have to get used to the fact that it looks a little different, but it's still beautiful and green and you don't see any weeds in there. Another idea is to increase the diversity. And one way you could do that is by adding white clover. And so this is something that's gaining a lot of popularity. Clover used to be common in yards. When I was a child, Dutch white clover was in every yard. But then with the advent of using all these broadleaf herbicides in our yards to kill dandelions, the clover went away. But now people are getting interested in bringing it back in and there are interesting new varieties of white clover. Um, one is a micro clover that's a lot smaller than the typical Dutch white clover and um, all the clovers have advantages in that they reduce nitrogen use by one to two pounds per thousand square feet because these plants are legumes and they naturally fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. They create a lush dark green lawn. You can see in the picture how lush and green that clover area is. They do mix well most of the time with cool season turf grasses. Sometimes you might get a little bit of a dominance of the clover, especially in lower nitrogen areas. And to achieve this, there's two different approaches. One, you could start from scratch and plant grass seed that contains about 5 to 10% clover seed by weight. Or you could seed into existing turf by mowing very closely, then aggressively dethatching to open up some niches. And then you would seed your clover in and water it well to get it established. So that's how you create this. There are a few drawbacks. 2,4-D will damage clover. MCPA is generally okay. But the idea is really that you would want to get away from using herbicides in your yard. I have clover in my yard, and I haven't used any herbicides in many years. Another possible detractant is that clover attracts bees, which some people really appreciate because they want to help the pollinators. But this could be an issue for people with bee sting allergies or perhaps people with children. Another advantage that I might mention is that clover is naturally resistant to pet urine. So if you have a dog and you're tired of all those yellow patches, maybe a clover yard would be something that you could try. So some more ideas to cut down on the weeds and the mowing and the herbicide would be to mow a little less. In my yard, I only mow once every two weeks. I let the grass just get a little bit longer. I aim for about four inches instead of one to two like most people aim for, and that really helps outcompete all those weeds. Another thing that you can do is early in the summer or late spring, just go out and pull a few dandelions. I spent maybe two hours pulling dandelions in my yard last year, and I never had to worry about dandelions again. My, my yard looked great, and I didn't use any chemicals. Another thing that you can do to cut down on the fertilizer, in addition to planting legumes like clover, is don't remove the organic matter from your yard. It's valuable. It feeds your yard. So instead of bagging your clippings, use a mulching mower and let those clippings decompose back into the soil. And then in the fall, and I tried this last year for the first time, and it was really a lot of fun and so much less work than raking and bagging all those leaves. I just ran my mower over the leaves a couple of times. And I found some research from the um, Michigan State University, and they did this for two years and showed that after two years of mulch mowing leaves, dandelions and large crabgrass were reduced by 100%. So not only are you saving labor and you're adding organic matter to your yard, but you're also suppressing weeds. So it's just a win-win-win to do this. Um, to make it even better, get an electric mower, and then you're not polluting. So there's, again, lots of benefits of trying to have a more natural and ecologically balanced approach to lawn care. It's 
less costly, less laborious, it's safer for pets and children, you can reduce your fuel consumption and noise pollution, you won't harm your edible and ornamental plantings, and it can be very beautiful if you can just shift your mindset away from the idea that a lawn has to be a perfect weed-free, closely mowed, grass-only situation. So those are the benefits, but there are some barriers to adopting this kind of lawn care. Your neighbors may not understand and they may be upset with you. If you're growing your vegetation taller than eight inches high, many city or city ordinances, including Fargo, I know, does um, pro prohibit that kind of vegetation. Moorhead, Minnesota, on the other hand, has a natural lawn care program, and you can apply to the city to do almost anything that you want. You just have to present them with a plan that they then approve. But if your city doesn't have that option, what can you do? You can talk to your friends and neighbors and tell them what's great about what you want to do with your yard. And then you can also, in the process of changing attitudes, maybe work to change your city ordinances so that you can have a program like Moorhead, Minnesota does. And I think that's all I have for you. I hope that you guys will enjoy trying to take a more natural approach to lawn care. And if you have any thoughts or questions, I would be happy to address them. Okay, Greta, we've got some questions already for you. Uh, the first question has to do with that uh, fescue that you mentioned. Is it and is it hardy in this climate? And how how tall does it get to grow? How tall does it reach? Well, I don't know. I would. I don't know if it's hardy in this region. Um, and as far as how tall it gets, I think it's meant to on, only get, you know, about six eight inches tall. And in in the picture, you could see that it wasn't it wasn't especially tall. It tends to sort of fall over and mat down. There are some uh, fescues can be more warm season and so you might look into it but there may be different varieties that would be suitable to uh, cooler climates. Yeah you know you mentioned no mow fescue you know that is a that's kind of a trade name and I know a like prairie nursery used to offer no mow fescue um, as like, and it, you just showed a beautiful picture of it, and uh, so I think it's hardy in zone four at least. So that's something okay. to investigate. Yeah, that's good to know. How about uh, there are a lot of interesting clover that you stimulated. Uh, does clover do well in part shade? Mm, I think that it would do it would do okay about as well as turf grass um, in super shady areas it's probably not going to be that happy how you know you talk about how plants compete with one another how do dandelions compete with clover you know, it, what I've noticed in my yard is that the dandelion, there's some areas where the clover patches are really thick, and there seem to be fewer dandelions in those areas than in the areas that are more pure grass. So I think that the clover is a pretty good competitor against the dandelions, but if you, if you stop using the chemicals altogether, you're probably always going to have a few dandelions. And that's why I usually just go out and pull a few of them out and keep on top of it that way. But the mowing, the real key is to mow at a higher height. That's what yep. really helps keep those dandelions down. But you, if you already have a lot of dandelions, uh, you, you might benefit from pulling a few of them out in the spring. Okay, how about, you know, another problem with clover, they say, is it stains the kids' clothes more when they roll oh, the grass. Yeah. 
does it stay in the grass? <laughs> I, you know, I, never, I don't have kids, so I never had to do that. You know, that's, I love it when my kids come home with, we have grass stains in the yard. That means they're active and having a great time outside. So I think Tide and most other normal uh, standard detergents will get out clover stains. It's not a, it's not going to kill your, it's not going to ruin your clothes. How about, you know, why do those weeds grow so much faster than the plants that you want, you're trying to grow? That's a question. Well, that's a, a really colonizer question. Yeah. So um, if you go back to my um, definition of a weed as being um, ecolo an ecological definition, and so the, that's based on the function of a plant and that a lot of weeds are colonizers. And the reason that they are, are good colonizers is that they grow very quickly and they take up nitrogen very fast. That's their function to grow fast, to cover an area that's disturbed, to hold it in place until the slower growing, more slowly establishing plants have time to come in. That's what it means to be a pioneer of succession. And so a lot of weeds respond very well to nitrogen. And a lot of studies have been done about this in, in cropland. They've showed that weeds like pigweed and lamb's quarters benefit from extra nitrogen, much more than a crop of wheat would. And so that's one reason why people got interested in using banded applications. I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with the yard, but sometimes when you're applying a lot of nitrogen fertilizer to your yard, you're just encouraging the weeds almost more than the grasses, depending on what the weed species is. Okay, let's uh, keep moving through these questions. Uh, there's someone who lives in western North Dakota and they're looking for a recommended grass seed that can especially be useful in lowering their water usage. I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Like I said, I'm not really a turf grass expert, and so I don't know that much about specific varieties. I think that most grasses need some water, and that's why in areas that don't have a lot of water, like in California or New Mexico, you're generally recommended to do something else like zero it's called xeriscaping where you would grow plants that are really suited to drier conditions and if i lived out in western north dakota where they get 10 inches of rain a year i might try doing something like that if i was tired of watering constantly i think that would be a lot more ecologically sound i think most grasses are going to need some water yeah, I think you had some good points also about the management. Like if you mow tall, that will the tall turf will naturally shade the soil and keep it moist. And also, uh, when you wa let the clippings fall, that will be a natural mulch that can reduce water use. Um, I would have this gardener consider in incorporating some crested wheat grass which is a zero scrape, zero scape, you know, a, a drought tolerant grass. And that's pretty common out here in the West to add that to your bluegrass mix. Um, do you want to talk about how we control creeping Charlie, Greta, or is that more um, of a... Yeah, I, the one thing that I've heard that works for that is using a borax solution. Have you ever heard about, heard that, Tom? Yes, that uh, uh, borax is actually, uh, uh, Creeping Charlie is especially sensitive to borax. And um, although it, borax, it's not labeled for use as a herbicide, so we can't officially recommend it. You can find information. This started from Iowa State over 20 years ago, how they discovered this. And there's recipes that can help 
this to suppress cre creeping Charlie. But, you know, I also like your idea, Greta, as far as, you know, I think creeping Charlie is not the ugliest weed out yeah, there. That's, that's the, the other British, thing. The British exactly. grow it, you know, in their yard. Just Those rich, rich Brits, you know, around their castles, they like creeping Charlie. And, yeah. uh, and cut your I mean, lawn all, all that helps. It has an interesting smell to it when you cut it. Yeah, it's in the mint family. Yeah, yeah. People use it for tea. How about that? Um, how about, uh, you know, Greta, the problem with your natural lawn, you're going to attract too many bunnies. And that's going to Oh, be yeah. <laughs> well, I actually, um, I like it because the bunnies stay out of my garden because they're so happy oh. eating the clover in the yard. Okay. So if you're trying to grow vegetables in your garden, it might actually be helpful to keep the bunnies out of your lettuce. Yeah. But yeah, it's true that the rabbits like the clover quite a bit. But we can we can deter that by putting a fence around the garden. Then we've got the best of both worlds. We can have lettuce and clover. Um, how about a uh, question here? I'm gonna kind of maybe focus on questions. Let's see. Uh, the question about uh, long grass and mosquitoes. Yep, that, have you had any experience with that, Greta? Do you have more of a mosquito issue in the tall turf? Mm, I I don't think that would really be an yeah. issue. That is I mean, really mosquitoes tall. are gonna breed in standing water. So unless yeah. whatever you're doing is generating standing water i don't i don't think that it's gonna affect the mosquitoes very much how about have you any had any experience with use of fine fescue as a a low input lawn product i haven't okay that's also uh that's that's less uh Less in, that has that requires less input. It's um, and it's more suited for it's, it's better sh for shaded areas. So if you're got a shaded area, a fine fescue can work there. Um, another uh, xeriscape grasses include blue, blue grama grass or buffalo grass. Have you have you had any experiences with that, Greta? Well, those are native prairie grasses, and I would think that they wouldn't look quite like a typical yard and they might be more difficult to establish but it's possible I think that the the crested wheatgrass is really a better idea I know that out at the Dickinson Research Extension Center, for example, there a lot of their grassy borders have a lot of crusted wheat grass and it seems to do really well. But I don't see those other types of grasses. In, yeah, those, those, the, native, those native grasses are, uh, they tolerate warm weather better. So what happens is the lawns, oh, my neighbor has uh, buffalo grass and his lawn is very slow to green up in spring and it, it looks good for a couple months of summer but then it gets it starts turning yellow quickly again so that's be aware of that that's a warm those are warm season grasses low maintenance though um as far as we don't have any recommendations about the best clover varieties do we greta or how do how would you go about handling that are there are there lawn varieties of clover um, well, there's the regular Dutch white clover, and then there's this micro clover that I'm talking about. And I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're different species. They're certainly different varieties. And I think people are interested in the micro clover because it's shorter. And you might be able to, if you were interested, for instance, some have created 100% clover yards that you don't have to mow. Okay, so I think that's that's a new term I learned tonight, micro clover. So I think yeah. that's, that's something to think about and to focus on. Yeah, so if you had the micro clover, it would 
and you wanted to let's say you wanted to keep your vegetation below that eight inch limit that most municip municipalities require then if you grew the micro clover it would just naturally be short and you wouldn't have to mow so much at all how about uh, i know you're a canadian thistle expert this person oh, yeah. keeps struggling <laughs> with canadian thistle um they keep cutting the ground level and it just keeps coming back they sprayed the patch with roundup but it still comes back Maybe they should yeah. watch the Ring Fever presentation two years ago about how to control. How big? How big I wonder how big of a patch it is. I don't know. Well, I guess in terms of things that are legal, um, there's probably not not a lot that you can do as far as herbicides go. Um, if you where if it's not that big of a patch and you're really determined to get rid of it, you could spray it with Roundup. I, spray it. It one thing about treating Canada thistles, it really matters when you treat it. And so if you spray it in the fall, that's when the plant is translocating um, sugars down into the roots for fall storage and so it'll suck that herbicide down into the roots and kill the roots more so you might try altering when you're spraying it and then if that doesn't work you and it's not that big of a patch i've had some luck with getting rid of canada thistle using um putting down some heavy landscaping fabric and then a, a bunch of organic mulch on top of that and just smothering it for a couple okay. of years. And that that might get rid of it if you're willing to put up with that unsightly, you know, mulch in your yard if it's not that big of a patch. But Canada thistle is, is a tough one. It really, um, it, it's almost a signal to me that Generally speaking, Canada thistle shouldn't be in turf grass. Healthy turf turf grass, I don't think of as being invaded by Canada thistle all that readily. And to me, that's kind of a sign that maybe uh, there's there's some underlying reason why the grass isn't as healthy as it could be. So you could work on that too. Okay, and we're just going to do one more question so we can stay on time tonight. And uh, what about this person's worried about disturbing the hibernating pollinators in the lawn? Like, should they wait until the weather is consistently above 50 degrees before they work the lawn? Have you heard about that? Does early working the lawn hurt hibernating pollinators? Any idea on that? Mm hmm. I, I wouldn't worry about that. I, I don't I don't think it's going to have that big of an impact, and I'm not sure that they're really hibernating in the lawn necessarily. How about, do you know anything about red clover versus white uh, clover? Red, red clover wouldn't be as good because it's it's not as, it's much taller, and it doesn't form um uh, a turf like surface uh, I like red clover in in other places I like it as a plant it's great to plant it in alfalfa to add a little diversity to alfalfa but as far as a legume in a yard I wouldn't recommend that one Okay, so now I'm just going to tell the YouTube users, Bob, that someone has a question about Bermuda and St. Augustine lawn. My goodness, that's not North Dakota. That's, <laughs> more, that's down south. Hey, that's, so, that's for, for where I'm from. Okay, well, okay, or yeah, Zone yeah, 5 yeah. at least, I don't know, but uh, they... We'll have uh, Alan Zook in, a, in about a week or two. He can talk about general lawn care and the same with using trichoderma or bacillus in the lawn. So I think let's let's try to stay on time tonight. And thank you, Greta, for your presentation very much. It was 
really very interesting, I got to say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good evening, everyone.